That is a tough, <clears throat> that is a very tough act to follow. Can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me? Uh, Harry Michelle has been a lifetime charter member of the McGuffey Society. He is literally a walking encyclopedia of local, social, cultural, ethnic, industrial, political, cultural, and education history here in Mahoning Valley and in the state of Ohio. In fact, he just drove in from Columbus, if you could believe it, to be here today. Uh, the man needs no introduction, and we will have a question-answer period at the end of the program, and after the program, you are more than willing to have refreshments once again, courtesy of the McGuffey Society. I would hope some of you would consider becoming members out of the National Federation of McGuffey Societies at one time, 100,000 strong. We are the last chapter in the country. And we have 50 members as of today's obituary, and we do have McGuffey family members in our organization. So please consider joining our organization or come to our future programs. With that, I now give you Honorable Harry Michelle. Harry? much. Is this on? It's Can you on. hear me back there? Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Because I'm going to have a money raising voice to make <laughs> a minute or two raise money for somebody or something. But no, I do want to appeal to each and every one of you to follow the advice of Rich Garcella and, and consider joining the William Holmes McGuffey Society. It is, it is one of the classical societies dealing with education and the history of it in this nation and much of it started here in this valley. That's the key thing to remember. Cornersburg was a land where Kennedy, where were Kennedy, where, uh, where uh, William Holmes McGuffey lived for a long time during his youth, and and then translated all those values in the collection of his books. I bought a new collection. I don't have an old one, <clears throat> but the William Holmes McGuffey uh, uh, reader was you know prominent in education for many many years. So that's my sales pitch for for McGuffey. And for those of us who are born and raised on the East Side, don't. Please don't get upset with me if I refer to the East Side frequently. That was the kernel of our, our development in, in my family and, and so many other people in our community. And the, uh, the beauty of it is that, as I've argued and, and convincingly, I hope with some people, indicated that the great, great characteristic of Mahoning Valley, many people don't fully acknowledge and, and respect or appreciate. We have been one of the most multicultural, multi-ethnic groups in the nation, in the Mahoney Valley. We were the fortunate ones to have people from Europe, Africa, uh, Middle America, South America, all come to this part of the country and settle in this valley. No one else in the nation has the kind of complex combination of ethnicity that we have here. Every religion, every color, every language, every art uh, history, every literature, liter uh, history, anything that relates to the growth of the human, the human being in this nation. No one has that done. I've traveled the whole country, been in every state except Alaska, and visited all the state capitals and all these places. Nobody has got that multiplicity of, of awareness as we've got. Where else could you go, and I argue this very simply, and I've done this before, so if you've heard it before, you'll, you'll uh, forgive me for repeating it, but we're the, one of the few communities in the country who know the difference between a Ukrainian and a Russian. <laughs> yeah. who know the difference between a, a Croatian and a Serbian. The difference between a, someone who's Polish and someone who's Czech Republic and, and who, is, who is Slovak. All of which are exceedingly important. And then we've had a, a, a great growth of the Jewish community like no one else has had in any part of the country. And then what happened? Europe thought they were chasing out people they didn't want there. They were sending their artists and their accomplished people into this country and into this valley. We ended up having people run out of countries in Europe who came and settled here. Artists, violinists, musicians of all kinds, ultimately lawyers, scientists. That's the kind of history they brought over. And no one began appreciating that much in the early years when I was a youngster until I went to Columbia and I began seeing books written by somebody with a name that sounded like Paderewski 
or some long Italian name or some long Jewish name you couldn't pronounce. And suddenly they decide, God, here's the culture of the world in these books that we're buying, very pricey by the way, and who's writing them? All these foreigners who came to this country and made America what it is today. That's the pride each and every one of us has to have for this valley, the whole valley. Not just the east side, not just the south side, north side, or whatever it's been. But that's the depth of, of understanding and beauty that we need to have. Now, some of us who grew up in that era uh, can't thank the world enough for having been born then. I think I was one of the luckiest people in the world. Of course, I was born on Friday the 13th, so I know I was. <laughs> so I know I was lucky. I used to look for, I used to get people upset because aren't you, aren't you at all uh, fearful? Uh, aren't you worried about the Friday the 13th? I said, no, I'm looking for ladders to walk under and black cats to call <laughs> in front of my path because I always thought that being born here was enough. And with parents who came from Greece, you know, they got married and then left Greece immediately and came here out of Naples and took a ship out of Naples and came here. And I don't even know how they got to Youngstown, frankly. They had a dollar ninety-eight or whatever was in their pocket, so they didn't have to stay too much at the uh, <clears throat> on the island. They could come straight into the into the nation. How they found Youngstown, I'll never know. We never did find out. But we settled in Youngstown, and that's where six children were born. And, and all of us went to East High. Not all of us graduated from East High, but because some went to work early. And remember, that was in the 40s and, and in the late 30s. So people had to work for a living and, and look for something to do. And I know that we did all kinds of strange things then. And you have to remember the reason why people have a love for families in this community <coughs> is because the families helped each other. We were, we were an, uh, an integral part of one another. And they were sure there were fights and arguments and all that sort of thing. But the, the families were never stronger than what they were then. If, if five, six people in the family worked, the money that they earned went on the kitchen table. The money from the kitchen table would be put into a bowl or a jar in the, in the cupboard in the kitchen by mother and then would dole it out, pay the bills and dole it out if there was anything left. But it was, a, if you're talking about a Communist Party that was perfect, that was ours. <laughs> you shared and shared alike, only what you needed. And so everyone worked, everyone did whatever they could. And we sold newspapers, uh, Overlean Sav in those days, all kinds of, whatever it took, magazines on holidays. Uh, you couldn't get a newspaper route. They were very difficult to get at that time. But you did everything you could. I became like a scrap collector. I was an expert at it. In fact, as I had carried a little uh, magnet around with me, what are you doing with that? I said, well, I can distinguish between one kind of metal and another because I know what's most valuable. And, and then you could tell that the tin, if you usually sought out places where there'd been a fire of any kind, you know, people were burning them, left over whatever they threw out. Well, if you sought through there and you, you touched metal with the magnet and it didn't come up, you knew it had to be either aluminum, brass, copper. Now those are the three big ones that paid uh, bigger, price, bigger, bigger prices if, if uh, you took it to a scrap yard or if a scrap collector came through your neighborhood. And it was, it was an opportunity to make money no matter what you did. I always had pennies in my pocket because I went around collecting junk all my life. In paper bags and all, I still do. I've got about 2,000 books in the basement and my, my shelves are all filled. I won't throw anything away. Um, and, and I've, I've collected stuff from all over the world. I've sold most of that now. But it, it's been a matter of accumulating. You become acquisitive when you're, when you're uh, without too much of, of uh, property value, so-called, that sort of thing. We, we lived on every side of town. We lived on the east side, of course. Very proud to be east side graduates. Very proud of the McGuffey School. You won't remember it too well at all, but perhaps it was mentioned by Rich. McGuffey School was, you know, you know where Albert and McGuffey were, Albert Street, and, and if, you, if you went toward Madison heading west, just a short distance was McGuffey School. Two years, you had school there, kindergarten as well. My mother marched me down there when I was five years old, I knew she wanted to get rid of me. <laughs> I always raised a lot of sand about going to school, I need books, I was looking for something to read all the time, and I tried to read at night with a lamp in bed. They almost threw me out of the house because I was going to set fire. You know, we had eight people in the family, two bedrooms. 
So the males were in one room and the females in another. I always asked my mother and father later on, how'd you procreate six kids? <laughs> yeah. you had two bedrooms and you were separated the way you were. And my mother always smiled at me and said, you'll find out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That was, it was just a beautiful environment. That's all there was. My father was highly, highly, highly educated. Uh, the Shinnaman was a philosopher in many ways. Uh, in those days, you couldn't find work very easily. And particularly if you came from certain parts of the world. If you came from certain parts of the world, you had access to jobs more easily than others did. And if you had a kind of a crazy ethnic background, like Greek or Hungarian or whatever it might be, Italian, uh, you weren't first picked. But that was all right, because one way or another, my father would find work, and there was nobody needed to preach places. You have a wood-burning stove in the living room. Forget radios, television, computers, all that. They didn't exist. And the, to listen to a Joe Lewis fight in the 30s, we had to go up to my black friend up the street, Jackson's family, uh, who were good auto mechanics, by the way, had the first auto mechanic job in the city of Youngstown at the Court of Republic in Albert Street. And, and uh, his two sons became good friends of mine. The one son became one of the, uh, the black pilots in World War II who distinguished themselves uh, at the time. The younger brother, Carl, and I were real close, and, and I was godfather to his, one of his kids at that time. It was an amazing history of dealing with people who knew what, the, what life was and knew the values of human beings and, and dealt with them on an everyday basis. Everybody fought, had differences. We played, you know, we played hockey on the streets with tin cans, and, and uh, it was fine until somebody who was left-handed would get on my side and try to hit the can down that way. And of course, cracked over, cracked open my skull here for a little bit with one of the swings that he did. But it was the kind of thing that you may do. And a father who really didn't care if you broke a window, and we did periodically. And I'd run up to the house apologetically. He said, "That's only a window, son. Go back out and play." So it's real stability, uh, kind of stability that unfortunately doesn't exist very often today. One of those in-depth obligations that you have forever. That's why I've always felt very strongly about family. That's why I've had the good pleasure, and I'm boasting now, of being the first person ever at YSU at least to create a scholarship in the name of each member of my family. It's something I think anybody in this room ought to do because it's a lasting tribute and it's there forever. Once you do, once you create a scholarship for YSU, it's there as long as the school's going to be there. And it doesn't take a great deal of money, so do it. It's a good way to do it. And by the way, you can take it off your taxes, so it's a contribution. <laughs> it's a contribution as well. But the, that's the kind of history that some of us came from. And that's why in public life, it was easy to think about people. So I did as many things as I could to serve people who needed the representation. Some of that's being done today by some people, but not everybody. Today we worried then about the first Bill of Rights for the Handicapped. Physically challenged was my bill in the country. The first piece of legislation that dealt with, with uh, the state being involved in economic development by giving out grants, by making loans, was by legislation to create a uh, half a billion dollar program in the state of Ohio under Jim Rhodes, Governor Jim Rhodes at the time that made loans, grants, and guarantees available to people to go into business from the state. It was, these are the kind of programs that meant so much. The uh, infrastructure fund that you all just renewed again at election, uh, the last election we had, was another one is half a billion dollars, I made it a billion dollars at that time, which had, went into the infrastructure because I saw a street cave in in Columbus, a road caved in and a car fell into it. Now you see pictures of that periodically because the tunnels and the sewers underneath are they're, they're 50, 60, 100 years old. We have some of that in Youngstown, by the way. And we created a, a, a piece of legislation, went to, the, went to the ballot, people had to vote on it. And, and it passed, and it was the first one in the country. Now we just renewed that every 25 years, I guess it was, and it passed again unanimously uh, in the last election. And that gives money to people to deal with, with the infrastructure in their communities. And then trying to replace the sewer funds, or sewer and water, wastewater treatment plant, and all these, all these projects. Those kind of things come from the awareness you can develop in a community like Youngstown. Don't ever take a back seat when it comes time to talk about where you come from. 
And anything about familial relationships, anything about religious language or any of these things, because all of them have created a bulwark, a bulwark of intellectual advancement by individuals in this little village of ours called Youngstown that very few people have in the rest of the country. And I've seen it in Columbus, and I'm not picking on anybody there uh, negatively, although I could. And, and I've had a lot of fun, fun fighting because that's the one thing you learn in life is you, you come back people for ideas. And the difficulty today is, in Congress especially, no one wants to debate the issues because they're afraid of losing. Well, you got to be able to lose. Don't worry about losing. I ran for office like Lincoln three or four times was defeated. Abe Harshman was my treasure when I ran for Congress, and I was defeated. Obviously by somebody more worthy in the public's eyes at that time. Not in mine, but in, <laughs> but that person won. And so that's I ran for county commissioner against the heroes in this town. I ran against the Catholic Church, the labor organization, everybody else, the Irish community, the Italian community, all of which outnumbered Greek community. Greek community was so large you could meet in a telephone. <laughs> but it was one of those things you had to put up with. So you take losses and you pick up, you dust off your knees and start out again, all over again. You keep moving. And fortunately, I was able to do that in the legislature. And even there, we had to fight for every inch of the way. But we did a lot of great things at that time. They're still being done by some people. Don't misunderstand. There are many, many good people in government on both sides. They have to work pretty hard at it. Those are the kind of memories you get. But what, what happens to you along the way? And I, I just brought two dozens of everything, but I can't show them all to you. I, that, that you you wind up in the in the uh, travels and, and activities that you have over the years that give you an opportunity to learn something. I've been fortunate. I've been to Israel five times. I've been to Egypt five times. I've been to China five times. I've been to Taiwan three times. Japan three times. India once. Uh, I've been into Nigeria. We opened up the trade office for the state of Ohio in Lagos, Nigeria, when they had to keep the doors locked because they were kidnapping people at that time out of the cars. And, and they're still doing it. Now it's worse. But we've had the great experiences which taught you something. You know, when you looked at the Sphinx and you looked at the, at the uh, pyramids in Egypt, you knew they were there for a long time. And you knew somebody knew a lot more than you do now about how that came about. So the history of mankind's intellectual development was there. We just don't always acquire it the way we should. I went to the, my folks come from the island of Crete, Greece. It's the largest island in the Mediterranean. And, and uh, at the end of that island, or almost to the end of it, is a place called Knossos, K-N-O-S-S-I-S. Now that K is silent in Greek, they call it Knossos. But it is an early civilization that rivaled the Egyptian, and maybe even preceded Egypt for a little bit, that goes back four or 5,000 years. They had running water, they had bathtubs for the queen, they had a, chair, a seat for the king. You go through that, you see it, the, and some frescoes are still on the wall. Bullfighting was, uh, was uh, a prominent then. Dancers on the bulls, you'll see uh, frescoes on the wall. It was just marvelous what you can find out in the world you also diminish your own personal sense of aggrandizement. When you see that, they were ahead of you four, five, six thousand years. And you, they created alphabets, they created activity, they manufactured, created the, the, the uh, early Roman, the early Greek uh, histories, early in the struggles of, of the uh, Israeli uh, uh, world and trying to find a place <coughs> to live and, and, uh, and getting mauled and handled by dictators in different parts of the world. Uh, and the blacks slow struggle to get to where they are today. Very slow struggle if you observe any of them. And, and there's something you, that each, you know, each of us in this country have to pay a little more close attention to because we don't, we just, when we get through with our ham and eggs or whatever it is, not everyone eats ham, I know, but you, you, when you get through with that breakfast, you know, you, you think everything is right, right with the world, you got the vindicator in front of you, you got TV, you can catch news and all that. It's a beautiful existence that we've created for ourselves. But you have to remember there's so many people in this world who are starving, literally starving. And we've got to keep, we got to worry about that to a degree. Because the benefits that we've received, didn't, weren't all given or created by us, personally. 
much of that was given, much of that was created by others, and then very, you've been very fortunate if you had good parents, and most of us had extraordinary parents who with very little were able to train you, educate you, and teach you uh, the real values of things in the world. Those of us who were in the military uh, fought, we went there uh, gratefully to defend the country that was very important to us. So I have three brothers, three of us were in the service at the same time. My eldest brother ended up in China, Burma, India. He went in in 1941. My second eldest brother, George, went in in 42. He was in combat uh, uh, troops in, in Normandy, got wounded there. And then I went in last in 43, and I ended up uh, in the South Pacific for two years. Two years, not two days, not two months, not two weeks. We didn't have television cameras. We didn't have, uh, we didn't have anything. We, were, we didn't even know where we were when we first landed. And, and that was just the way it was. Nobody told you anything. And we were on the ocean. We were on the ocean for uh, a total of 70 days to go from New England to the island of New Guinea. 70 days, and when you go across the Pacific during World War II, you didn't have any escorts because all you had to do was dodge submarines, Japanese submarines. You had no time for anything else. Nobody was there with planes hovering over you, protecting you. Who the heck could get out in the middle of the Pacific and protect you? Anyway? So that's where that's where the old saying came from. Uh, there are no atheists in foxholes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, everybody learned how to pray. And they didn't care what you were praying about, you know, whether it was Jesus or whether it was somebody else that name. And sometimes they didn't even know the name, but they would pray to it. And, and uh, it was a great experience, though, because it taught you self-reliance, uh, self and you got rid of some of your fears, and, but you knew you were there for the right cause. And so you, you come back with a lot of good memories, and, and the heavens, when things settled down in the Philippines, we landed in two different places in, in the Philippines, but I became a godfather over there. And I wasn't even Catholic. But, the, you know, the strong Catholic uh, religion is Hispanic based in, in the Philippines. And beautiful people. Beautiful people. And it was just another great experience. I had a pig roast when I turned 21. That's when I started smoking like a fool. I hadn't smoked all those years, but I started that bad habit to pick up. But I thought you were allowed to do anything that. It took me a long time to quit, but I finally did. Now, in the, this country, with the, uh, the thing that politics can do for you is express yourself, number one. Number two, occasionally accomplish something. Number three, take a little credit for it without expanding your own.